for the first round of IBA Nations League 2020. Uh, really excited about this tournament and really excited to invite you all uh, to this online edition of an IBA event. Um, before we start, uh, I would encourage everybody to use uh, gender neutral language throughout their speeches to address anyone. Um, we all read the motion, so without further ado, let's start. Uh, the first speaker of the opening government here. Okay, uh, just making sure I'm audible. C can you confirm that you can hear me? Loud and clear. Yes. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll just one, one, one. Uh, I forgot one thing. Um, sure. I think I think before we start, should we all introduce ourselves uh, to the room? Uh, I'm I'm Tosif. I'm chairing this round. Uh, Panel with me are Amira and Nicholas. Uh, can we go around the room from OG to CO? Uh, can you all introduce yourselves, if, if that's okay? In, in opening government, uh, Ayal speaking first, Roy speaking second. Opening opposition, Sarah speaking first, um, Benji speaking second. Uh, closing government, um, Ashish and Shermi, I think I'll... Can people hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. In closing opposition, can you speak first? No, let's go. Okay, uh, all right, let's get started. Prime Minister, here, here. Thank you. Just uh, please, if everyone who is not this, uh, speaking can mute themselves because otherwise it can be a bit distracting. Uh, and I will start in three, two, one, go. Two points I'm going to bring to you today in my speech. Firstly, I'm going to talk to you about why this is necessary to actualize freedom of religion. Secondly, I'm going to talk to you about why what alternatives exist and why they are significantly worse and why the status quo, therefore, is one that is why our mechanism is preferable to status quo in terms of the justice people actually get. In terms of mechanism, a few points that are important to notice. First of all, uh, we are talking about courts. We're going to discuss a range of, uh, of offenses going from uh, disturbing or speaking du loudly during prayer to extramarital affairs or even actual felonies. Um, however, note that if you have committed a crime against society, this is not, we don't have a problem with a double mechanism, meaning it's okay for the state to also prosecute you if you have done something that, uh, that goes against the, state, the rules of the state. The fact that this court has decided you're either guilty or innocent is not going to be a deciding factor within how the criminal justice system treats you. Thirdly, they are only allowed to punish you through things like fines or communal sanctions. Like they can say, you need to pay this person this and this amount, or they can say, we are going to, uh, we're going to uh, boycott you for this amount of time, nobody should buy from you, things of that sort. Uh, fourthly, uh, the judges in this court are going to get state, uh, state recognition, they're going to be, uh, get state training, and the, uh, the, record, the uh, discussions of this court are going to be recorded to make sure due process happens, and these uh, sort of things, if it's very, very basic rules of procedure have, uh, that uh, correlate with this religious community have not been followed, you're able to appeal uh, through that. Uh, we, uh, there is an, obviously also the necessity to give you a lawyer to represent you, someone who knows the, the rules of this religion, just like in a state court. And finally, we're we assuming this debate does not happen within religious states that already have these sort of mechanisms. Uh, if, if, to the extent that it does, we believe it happens in states that have, uh, let's say, a, that already have uh, that will also give other religions the ability to do so. So let's say if a Muslim country that has Sharia courts will also need to have Christian, Jewish, whatever, Buddhist courts uh, in its jurisdiction, are there clarifications? In terms of legal representation, i.e. lawyers, who are these people in particular? Are they state-appointed lawyers or are they religious officials? Uh, they are religious officials sanctioned by the state. People who have the relevant religious training, but have also been certified by the state, just like judges, everyone else within the sort of courts. Let's talk about actualizing freedom of religion. We say most religions are not only measures of personal salvation, but also a communal framework. It means nothing to be Jewish if you don't have at least nine other Jewish people around you with which you can have a minyan, meaning pray together, and your prayer is just deemed not accepted if you don't have that community structure around you. In Islam, 
the same thing. You, a lot of the, a lot of the religion relies around the notion of we are living as a community. We are making laws around our own community. The ability, therefore, to enforce standards over your community is a critical part of you being able to be a religious organization. As long as I am part of a religious community, this is justice that I consent to, and this is part of my a, a part of my religious identity, uh, both in the ability of my community to function properly, but in the fact that if it's enough for one person to disrespect the prayer that's currently happening for me, not to be able to exercise my religious fulfillment. But secondly, we also think that for that if I have sinned against my community, I need to be able to atone, which doesn't necessarily happen if I'm not able to be punished in the way that this community deems fit, in the way that the holy scriptures of this religion deem fit. So we're saying that your freedom of religion is denied just by that. But obviously oppositions are going to tell us, wait, what about people who are not able to actually opt out of that religion? We think several things on that. Firstly, we believe that the existence of these courts is now something that you take into consideration when you decide your level of involvement within that religion. And we, if we say that is definitely a consideration most people are able to make that say, uh, that what is the trade-off of what I'm gaining from this community as opposed to the things I'm losing? We don't say it's a perfect trade-off, but we believe it's one that exists and people are able to make that way. So, uh, note on the comparative that currently we do believe that the great majority of people within a religious community are actually religious, whether they have been, whether it's because of their completely free choice, whether it's because they have been, uh, uh, they've been so persuaded by the ideals of this religion, uh, been educated into it and so on. Therefore, we believe the majority of people are ones that actually do not currently have an opt-in or an effective way of opting in to those religious standards and to the religious courts. And we believe it's more important to prioritize them in this situation, given the fact that there are more people and do not currently have the ability to do it at all. Uh, on our side, we we'll achieve a better balance. Thirdly, if you have no power to resist your own community, if you have no power to opt out of it, it's also likely that you're not able to complain and go against your community if they apply other forms of justice on you, and we believe you're going to be under much worse conditions on, our si on their side of the house than you are under ours. Let's get to that right now. What are the alternatives? Let's understand. Your community still wants to enforce its standards on members of it. However, it also wants to, uh, to be included within the general society, maintain good relations with the state, to secure budgets, to make sure that they are well represented. Therefore, we believe that, uh, that when they don't have the ability of maintaining their religion, they are likely to go to other mechanisms, which I'm going to explain in a second. But we believe that at the point where you give them this outlet and you allow them to have their own courts, they are less likely to go into forms of uh, into illicit forms of enforcing their justice. Uh, so, in terms of the trade-offs, we believe we get a better form. What is that form? I'll explain in a second. But first, I will take a POI from either closing. Do you have anything? Okay, opening them. Yeah, sure. So status quo means that you already have rabbinical courts or courts that can do most of the stuff in the community that you've said, except for maybe levy fines. So where is the actual difference here? And also clarification, how do people opt in or opt out of this? Because you never said that. Uh, I, I think the opt out was in the motion. You opt out, you can opt out of the religion and then you're not under these courts anymore. Uh, the second thing is in states that already have these courts, that's fine. What we get in court states that don't and don't have state intervention within them, allowing them these authorities, including the authority to levy fines, which is an important one, uh, we believe that is what this motion does. If there are countries uh, in which this already happens, then probably there is no difference. Um, alternatives. So look, in the best case scenario, what we have is ad hoc courts the, uh, that do, uh, that aren't actually supervised by anyone, in, in which you don't know, in which the defendant is always going to be in a position, in a lower position, uh, in which you don't know what the precedents are, what is the tra uh, training and agendas of the judges. Uh, in the wor uh, worst case, you have, first of all, just religious extremism, religion going to much further extremes in order to stop you from being able to commit a felony they will not be able to account for. So for example, if, the, uh, if they are afraid a woman might behave immodestly with, uh, within a workplace, they will just deny her going to that workplace in the first place. We believe that's a much worse situation than one can be just confined the individual woman in an individual way, as opposed to denying all women access to jobs, education, and so on. Um, very proud to propose the motion. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you for the speech. Uh, I now request the first speaker of opening opposition right here. Hello, hold on, let me just adjust my lighting. Am I audible? Uh, yep. Yep.
I'm gonna start my speech in three, two, one, go. Okay, I think this OO, uh, this OG is insane. Um, they're basically saying that in order to opt out of this motion, you have to opt out of your entire religious community. You have to disown your religion and completely like isolate yourself from that community, get out of the community in order to opt out. This is not the guff that we expected coming up from OO, but this is going to be the guff that we engage in. And we're going to show you firstly why there is absolutely no consent or no meaningful consent for you to opt into this, uh, into, uh, into this decision anyway. Secondly, why this is the state going way too far in giving authority to religion and why that makes it very hard for you to regulate religion and ensure that they behave in appropriate and good ways. And lastly, some discussion on the alternative of state courts, specifically addressing uh, OG's claim that if you have no power within that religion anyway, you wouldn't have been able to like um, complain about the religion or complain about the abuses. We'll show you why that is possible on our site through state courts. Uh, most of my rebuttals will be integrated. Firstly, uh, a couple of clarifications. So the first thing I want to say is that like the status quo is that a lot of like civil cases can often be tried in things like Sharia law and the status quo. And that's obviously like already something that's happening in order for the gov to have to propose a new policy. And especially with the wording of the motion saying that we are punishing them, we assume that this is also going to uh, apply to criminal cases and that this is the state giving up their authority from like, for example, punishing someone as like for like um, theft and like allowing the religious court to punish that person for theft according to the way that the religious court works anyway. So this is like uh, either or situation and it's something that applies not just to adultery or not just to whether or not you're following those religious like tenets like prayer or whatever not but also to like things that are considered to be um, like criminal acts in the eyes of the state. Secondly, I want to just clarify that they are saying that basically you opt in on an entire basis, on the basis of your religious identification. And so the only way for you to opt out is that you denounce their religion or denounce their religious community. If this is not what OG wants to say, they have to clarify this in DPM so that my DLO can engage with that because that is specifically what PM said in reply to our POI. And lastly, I think there are no clarifications for how we're going to deal with cases with minors. So we're going to assume that the parents make the decision for minors, which is usually how we like do parent like parental consent for medical situations as well. I'm also going to talk about how this is incredibly bad for your consent and for your ability to have meaningful religious freedom within a state. Let's first talk about consent, right? I don't think that there's significant consent or like meaningful consent for you to be able to say, yes, I am going to opt into, into this like religious appar judicial apparatus rather than the state apparatus. The first thing is that most people, if they have like not been in that situation where they encounter the judicial system, especially in specific in that specific case of that specific like criminal act or whatever or not, they will not have a good understanding of how that state system works. Let's note that like the state judicial system operates in an incredibly diverse amount of ways. Your daily interaction in like small claims courts or your daily interaction on like low level crimes is very different from your interaction with the state courts on like larger and more major crimes. So there's no way for your past experience to be able to say that you are meaningfully willing to give up that consent and allow that the religious authorities to like claim that part of your life for like for like the indefinite future. So I think it's very difficult for people to imagine what those punishments look like. It's very difficult for them to get the information for what those punishments look like. It's really difficult with like state um, like institutions that have a huge amount of institutional reach to educate the people about their legal rights and educate them about what those punishments look like. You have lots and lots of lawyers who are very qualified in helping you in through legal aid clinics and whatever not. We think it's much less likely that you have access to that information to make a good choice if you're within religious institutions. One, because religious institutions are incredibly like non-transparent. They're very hierarchical. A lot of these decisions get made behind closed doors within like councils or within like religious like small bodies of religious authority that most people don't have access to. Number two, because that religious um, community and the environment that you have within a religion means that you're less likely to question or to like raise criticisms or like be able to respond to the people who are making the decisions at the top because the way the religious authority works is that the people at the top are often unquestionable. They're acting on behalf of that religious authority or entity that like has supreme authority within that religion. It's much harder for you to be able to question their decisions and whether the punishment is proportional or the punishment is just. I also think that this means that it's much harder for you to be able to question because you you conflate the religious authority and the supreme authority of the God with the judicial punishment that is being carried out by the like servants of that religion. It's much harder for you to question and say that they're abusing their power and therefore it's much harder for you to hold religious authorities accountable. But fourthly, I also think that religious communities tend to be incredibly discriminatory and isolation, isolatory towards minority communities. For example, women often can't even stand in front of the congregation to speak in some religious, let alone be able to take on a position of authority. For example, you often have to go through your local pastor, or your local imam, in order to be able to access higher levels of religious authority. And so it's incredibly um, localized, it's incredibly uh, uh, like 
uh, concentrated within the middle. And like, if you're in the segregated ends of the community, if you're in like these like peripheral regions or peripheral communities, it's much harder for you to be able to gain access to the central body. And lastly, because minorities such as LGBT minorities, other people who are closeted or who have multiple overlapping identities often find it very difficult to get um, like representation within the like monolithic and within the uh, mainstream religious community. This means that it's very difficult for you to opt out of the system. It means that when you're raised within a religious community, especially raised by your parents, that this is the only way that you're allowed to act or this is the arbiter for what is morally correct, it's very difficult for you to be able to shirk off that moral like language that obscures whether or not this is actually just a fair thing in the eyes of the state. I think this makes it incredibly easy for them to abuse this. Um, I'm going to talk about why this is going too far to religion. I've talked a little bit about accountability already, but before I move on, I'll take a PR from CP. Yes. Yeah, so, no, I, I just wanted to clarify. So, um, is your case just a generic religion case, and are you happy with religion existing in society? No. Yeah, so this is where I'm going to go about why this is aligned too far. So as a state, we're generally okay with like religious freedoms. We encourage people to have like, we, we obviously want to do everything we can to create that opportunity for people to choose which religion they want to opt into and have the freedom to practice their religion. However, what we define as the line for being too far, where the state gives too much power to religion, is when they give up their like legal authority to religious institutions. Because I think that that means that you like the religious institution therefore borrows from the authority of the state in order to clamp down on people. So now the religious institution has three spheres of authority, right? It has the moral authority from like religious authority from being like a representation of like the supreme god or supreme entity. It has the state's authority of being able to carry out punishment on behalf of the state. And it has the third authority, which is that it's already a leader within that like small community. I think that makes it impossible for you to appeal against the religion. It makes it much more likely that the religion is going to cover up abuses of power and be unfair in the way that it treats people. Even if this is just at the fringe cases, we think that the harm that happens on these fringe cases is much worse. What is the alternative with state courts? We think that when you have daily interactions with the state court, where you are expected to go to the state court even for the smallest of things, it means the state court is more understanding and more tolerant of your religious practices. Are, it's much better for them to develop the respectful understanding and respectful posturing to be able to deal with that community and therefore represent the community best, which means you have that rapport that is, means you are willing to go to the state court to deal with much more controversial and much more vulnerable cases, such as like sexual abuse or massive cover-ups against the church. For those reasons, of course. Thank you for the speech. Uh, now I now invite the first, uh, second speaker of opening government. Hey, hey. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So yeah, uh, three, two, one, go. Going to have a bit of rebuttal, then we'll talk about A, the alternatives to Sharia courts, and B, uh, uh, why we believe it is an absolute state obligation. Uh, before that, just note, we frankly did not hear an answer to Ayal's point. The idea that this is something that infringes on the basic religious freedoms of people was not something that was answered. We were told, well, you can do it to an extent, but frankly, it's unclear why that is something that they are okay with at this line. We understand it crosses their line. We don't understand why their line is the justified one on their uh, uh, side. Secondly, the idea that we have a much worse alternatives that Ayala has already started, again, not, uh, not uh, uh, engaged with at all. Let's start with some rebuttal to what you've heard. So A, we've heard Sharia courts exist anyway. Yes, this clearly, the motion is about places where they don't. We believe that where they do exist, this is a wonderful thing. Where they don't, this is where the motion happens. Secondly, they said, uh, there is no problem uh, because you can have civil courts. A, how many people in general go to civil courts? Very few people actually do. We don't understand why they are enough. B, we believe that this is especially true for religious minorities who do not think that the state uh, cares for their concerns. This is especially true about religious matters. No, no civil court even has the knowledge of what it means to eat kosher or not to eat kosher, and definitely not what is an appropriate or not an appropriate punishment for it. So again, don't see how that changes. But then we said, this Sharia court is just not going to be handled well uh, uh, for a few reasons. First they say, because it's hard to understand the system. 
First of all, this is true with the regular system as well. Most people, in fact, are, don't have law degrees and do not understand it. Still, the system works just fine. It works just fine because B, as we said, you have lawyers. On our side, you have lawyers too, religious lawyers, but still people who are very good at what they're doing. They understand what is the rights of their victims. They understand what is and isn't an appropriate punishment. They understand what they can agree on and what they can't and so on. Again, we don't see why that's not good enough. Three, we said that those would be transparent. You would have transcripts. So again, people, if they are really interested, can know how those courts make decisions. Those courts still have to justify the, the, their decisions. They're doing it today in Sharia courts. They will do it on those Sharia courts uh, regardless. And then finally, if it's just about public perception, make law and order Sharia special unit if for all we care, okay? Um, and then they said, oh, but minorities and women screwed over. And this is the part where we say, A, first of all, at least they have lawyers on our side. That's good. But B, this is just non-comparative what ha happens to them in the status quo, which I'll get to in a second. And then finally, they said, oh, but this is the state giving up legal authorities. We really don't understand why it's the state giving it up and not granting it with a condition. Just like we allow people to sign contracts as long as those are good contracts that are being done fair and consent. We don't understand why this is not the same here. You grant it to them, and what you gain in return as a state are people who are actually engaging with a system that defends them, which exactly brings me to my point about the alternative. Because what is the alternative on their side to such a court? We say, first of all, just worse courts. Courts that exist, but they are not out in the open, and they are much worse. They have no transcripts, you have no lawyers, you don't know why you got the pension. The, the punishment, you absolutely trust them less. Everything we've heard is a lot worse on their side. And usually those are the ones propagated by extremists. Those are the ones har harmful to minorities and women. Why? Because this is someone who is trying to establish a pirate court and a, an alternative to the state. This is something that only an extremist would do on their side. On our side, since they are sanctioned by the state and are out in the open, the moderates can actually join in and make their sure they offer a lot better. But secondly, when you don't have court, you just have mob justice. This is true everywhere. This is true in religion as well. You have a father who decides that he would be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. That he would interpret the laws however he finds fit. And if he found that his daughter went out with another man, regardless of his actual proof, then it is up to him to punish her in whatever way he finds fit. Once you have a, a court of law, you can now make sure that this is being done fairly, that she has her day in court, that she is represented, that the punishment is appropriate, that the interpretation is an appropriate interpretation, and so on. All of those are a lot better. But then thirdly, we said, as again, I said and was not engaged with, the alternative is just harsher norms. If you know that there would be nothing you could do if your daughter were to, to, uh, 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 to uh, 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 violate your decree in her job, you just wouldn't let her have a job to begin with. Those are much harsher norms make it worse for minorities, make it worse for women overall, at least on our side, the fact that you can make it on a case-by-case -case basis means you're not punishing everyone who shouldn't be punished uh, because it, of, of this very harsh norm. And then, uh, 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 and then uh, 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 finally, uh, uh, they said, oh, but now you need to denounce your entire religion. We are going to assume that there would be Islam minus Sharia for people who really cares about Islam, but they just hate the idea of Sharia courts, and they would have to denounce Islam with Sharia and then opt to Islam without Sharia courts. That should be fine for them, and we're pretty sure it's not a huge infringement of the religious right, and definitely, definitely not what's worse than what happens today, where many times they do have to deny their entire community and move out because the laws there are so strict and so harmful to them. They could have not been on our side. Before I move on to my second point, let's take a POI from second. Engagement, give me your case. No, opening opposition. Sure. So the answer to like preventing women from going to work is they can get legal emancipation from the state if they have state courts and therefore gain access to their freedom. They can't do that if the state withdraws their legal right to like the judicial system and therefore withdraws legal clinics and Sarah, other... Sarah, Sarah, Abby, Sarah, this is preposterous. If I live in a tightly integrated community and I know I would suffer severe consequences from my father and from my community for going to work, I would not do it. On our side, at least I can say, I'm going to work. If I do anything wrong, well, we have a court for that exactly. Let's talk just about the importance of courts in society. Because look, 
We know that courts are incredibly crucial. Goddamn libertarians would agree that courts are a fundamental part of the state. They are part of the state because they allow you to moderate the people in power and because they allow you to meaningfully uh, 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 solve disagreements between parties. Both of those just do not happen for people of a religious community. The existing courts do not care about the religious people in power because they're not even talking the same language, which is also the reason they can't even sort out basic disagreements. So we have an entire population that isn't getting a basic service that the state ought to give them. And for that reason, we are absolutely proud to propose. Thank you for the speech, inviting the second speaker of opening opposition. Here, here. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, yep. Yes. So starting in three, two, one. It's interesting to have an OG, which is both super cowardly in places and just cuckoo banana pants in others. So I'm like, they get the worst of both worlds by doing this. So where are they super cowardly? So basically what they're saying, what they don't seem to understand is that most of what they say is just something which is not only status quo, but also something that opening opposition can be fine with. And this is what we're saying, as in, if there are community courts that exist without any state power that like impose things such as like, um, uh, like you're not allowed to go to, you're not allowed to go pray with other people. You're not allowed to go to these, like you're not allowed to do things which have the community enforces that exists today that exists on both sides. That's not the motion. Right. And that also is the ability of like all of the religious freedoms that they very underanalyzed. They can just all get that all of that today under the community staff. What they had to do was explain to us why we needed to give them state power to do additional things, which is where they actually need to go into. The, the part of that, the other part of the case, which is cuckoo banana pants, is the idea of just like, oh, you have to opt out of your religion in order to do this. So like Shulman tries to pedal back madly from Eyal's like, original answer. But to be clear, this also means at the end of the day that the ability of people to opt out of this is incredibly, incredibly limited. From the moment I was born into this community, I have to leave my entire community in order to get out of doing things. And again, not for having community punishments, but from being punished by like actually having my livelihood taken away by a court and double jeopardy apparently under their weird mechanism because the state can also do this as well. So I'm going to go into a couple of things here. I'm going to go into explain to you why people will be able to go to the courts. And I'm also going to be talking about the comparative, but a couple of like a couple of answers before we go into this. So the first thing about they're like, oh no, but people don't have the ability to practice their religion. Literally the only thing that Eyal told us here was like, people need, you know, nine other men to, in order to pray together. There needs to be community boundaries to do this. Cool. Most of this stuff can happen under community courts that exist, but also it's incredibly unclear to us why it is that you need to have the ability to enforce every single one of your laws in order for you to be able to practice your entire religion. The fact is that most people don't do this today. And I'm also going to talk about like why laws change because of the interaction between people. The other thing that they said, like the other thing that they, uh, oh, I, actually this is the only thing which is like external. So let's go into this, like why people will go to the court anyway. So like we've already said that like community courts can exist on both sides of the house and isn't really the debate. But like we say that in order to for criminal court, for things which are like the state needs to be involved in, we would want the state to be there and for these state courts to exist. So they go, oh, this is ridiculous. Uh, the crazy communities will never go there. Look, this is so uncomparative. If the only people that they want to talk about from their side are the crazy religious communities, then these people aren't going to interact with your new state ordained courts as well, right? Like they're not going to have your beautiful transcripts. They're not going to send in lawyers. They're not going to do any of that, right? Because if they really hate them this much, it's just kind of ridiculous to assume. And even if they do exist, they're not going to listen to anything that kind of goes on there. Like most of this debate is happening in a place where there is interaction between the state and the communities, i.e. like 90% of religious, even fairly closed off communities. So what happens here? So first of all, like the state has an obligation to go in this. So like they need to do outreach and training for their people. There needs to be like local communal courts. Like, oh my God, this is what exists basically in most places. As in like, in, even in like places like fairly insular places, religious parts of like London today, like East London, there are like local courts. The magistrates there tend to come from the community. There tend to be lawyers and stuff which come from there. All of these things and there tend to be interaction with the state to teach people how to do this because the state has an obligation versus the abdication, which they're currently kind of pushing on towards us. On the other hand, of the 
part of the community. People, because there's a minimal amount of trust, people are going to court for like small stuff, as Sarah tells you, and he's never answered, learning about the court system, seeing that it's not that scary, and that builds up a trust in the system, which means that you can actually get to then also going for like the bigger things, such as like the abuse in the community, the problem in the community, everything else as well. Like there's a gradual buildup. But also note this works on the religious community level. The thing that they miss there, and again, like by just trying to propagate pr religious people is crazy, is just that people aren't that. Religious communities, and especially their leadership, interact with the government all the time. In fact, they tend to interact with the government a lot more than other people. Why? Because they're dependent on government services, such as like such as like healthcare and services because they tend to be poor, like poorer communities, and therefore they really actually rely on social benefits and stuff from the state, which means that there is buy-in and interaction even at this level, which creates the ability and means for them to kind of interact with them and to create this in a, in a back and forth, which means that they, the state can say to them, you can't be that ridiculous. You have to allow some people to go to court. You have to allow for some mechanism. This is just like how like common sense status quo of what exists in most places, except for the most extreme crazy things which Schulman tried to make this case about, which just isn't really that relevant. So what is the comparative here? The comparative is to a place where there's no accountability. Their answers is like, ah, ha ha, we said transcripts in the courtroom. Wow, cool guys. But if the actual laws themselves are not being written in the beautiful courtroom, so they're being written in small insular places, then those laws, right, are written by a tiny group of people, a tiny group of men with like, with, with, with who are, you have no ability to interact with or, or go against. So even if you have transcript, what's it gonna tell you? We followed Sharia law that was written somewhere else, which meant that a woman doesn't have a right to speak it. Cool, great, not helpful for us in order to actually get accountability. We're saying that if the state gives you the mechanisms of power to enforce itself on top of everything else the religious communities already have, there needs to be the ability to hold accountability and to push back against that. You don't get that, right? You don't get that in this kind of mechanism that sort of happens here, which is why we think at the end of the day that you need to have basic forms of accountability in order to hold in order to hold these people up, to, in order to hold these people accountable. I'll explain a little bit more of that in a second. We're going to take closing. Why does the state involve itself with the enforcement of contracts between private individuals? Why does the state do that? I mean, the state involves itself, again, if you go to a contract and you sign a legal contract, something which the government like, has decided, like the government has signed off on, in a court, then the government is able to go and enforce, and enforce that. That is a different system than if you were doing a different type of rules and laws. Also note that everything that we've explained to you about the ability to push back against this and to have that kind and to have those kind and to, and to be able to hold accountability for this means you can't do this. Also note the extent of the power of the amount that a, con that a private contract can do versus the amount of power that OG are giving to the state. These are different things, guys. There's a scale here. Try and be a little bit more nuanced. Okay, so at the end of the day, what, we're, what, we're, what we want to say here is that the comparative is that your ability to hold the state account, like to hold the state and, and people accountable, it is more likely, for instance, that women are able to go out to work and be, women are able to go out to work and able to also find justice. It is more likely that cover ups inside the community, such as like mass sexual abuse by imams or priests or rabbis, are things which come to the civil, which come to actual criminal court in order to be propagated because there is a level of trust. There is much more ability for people to access justice to begin with, but also to hold their communities accountable. On the other side, you have a tiny minimal amount of pain, which is caused to certain extreme tenets of religion, which we think is not enough to outweigh all of the things that we've spoken about. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, and I invite the first speaker of closing government. All right, so I'm going to talk about um, two things in extension. The first thing is uh, why we think this is a natural right, uh, a natural extension of people's right to choose their own moral codes and live according to them. Why in the fundamental interest of the government to facilitate people being to do that, why it's actually that might be the whole point of liberal democracy. And while you know, Ayal, the wonderful person who is, gave a wonderful explanation about this from the communal level, I want to talk about how this applies in a very individualistic level as well. I want to talk about how this actually protects vulnerable minorities in religious communities and also allows for judicial processes and norms to become more widely accepted in countries where state secular judicial organs are often weak and these sorts of courts can help to fill that gap. Um, since Benji reminded me to be nuanced, I will also try my best. So firstly, let's talk about uh, liberal democracy. We think a fundamental premise of liberal democracy is that the government has no right to dictate to you um, your personal moral beliefs, your personal sense of right and wrong. 
That's because these are questions which are inaccessible, unmeasurable, and unfalsified. Therefore, government allows people to determine what the best form of government, like moral codes by which they can live, unless they cause third-party harms to other individuals, right? We think this is fundamental. Why is it that we think, as a result of this, you need to be able to, you know, um, like contract your rights of enforcement to these courts? For a couple of reasons. The first thing is because we already do that in the norm. Oh, should I pause? I hear someone not being able to hear me. Because um, can, we, can, we, can we please uh, pause for a bit? Yeah, we can't hear a lot because someone's typing really loudly. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> I, nothing. <laughs> uh, all right, well, I'll, I'll give my entire speech again. Who is typing? Actually, I was going to mention, it's like that typing uh, noise host, seems to yeah, come from your to... microphone, Ashish. Sorry? I'm not typing. Um, Ash, I think Ashish's mic yeah. is the only one that's on, so... Yeah. Uh, Ashish, uh, is, your, is your Discord on, like, at the same time, and is someone typing there, maybe? Uh, I don't think so. Let me try and... Wait, someone's typing again. <laughs> Where is this yeah, it's, uh, it might be a problem with your mic, Ashish. I think it's uh, on Discord. Um, Naomi is typing. I'll mute her. Um, I'll mute them in a second. You can also deafen yourself in Discord. Discord isn't even open on my comp at the moment. Yeah, I just straight up closed my Discord as well. Yeah, so I don't know where it's coming from. Well, well, I don't hear it now. And you're typing now, so shall we just do this again? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's fine oh, now. We do that, yeah. Um, all right. Okay, so two things in extension. Uh, firstly, why we think this is a natural extension of people's fundamental right to decide their own moral codes and to live by them, and why the state has an interest in facilitating this. Secondly, why, especially among conservative religious communities, it actually offers more protection for minorities and actually helps to introduce to people useful judicial concepts like procedural fairness, like evidence, like appeals, especially in weak democracies where institutions of state judicial organs are weak. Firstly, therefore, let's talk about the stuff about the liberal democracy. We think that in a liberal democracy, the government is fundamentally agnostic about what right and wrong is within your personal sphere, about what you do to yourself. That is because right and wrong is fundamentally inaccessible, unmeasurable, and unfalsifiable to the government. So the whole point of liberal democracy, secular liberal democracy, is to give you space to discover that on your own. We think a natural corollary of this is that you have a right to put in place a system of punishment and reward that you think will best allow you to live out that personal code. I to point out, this is not a radical idea. People do this in their ordinary lives all the time, right? If I sign up for a gym membership, which is expensive, I do it because I think that might coerce me to go and exercise a bit more. If I ask a friend when I go to a bar to stop me if I'm already quite drunk, that is me outsourcing my personal freedom to someone who will enforce that on my behalf. The challenge coming from the opening opposition, I guess, is, well, then why does the state get involved? Why is community not enough? We think that massively understates and uh, misunderstands the importance of religions to people's lives, right? It's a fundamental part of their welfare. If you believe that you are a sinner, and for that you are going to burn in the fires of hell for eternity, that is psychological torment which any reasonable state would, be, would believe you have a right not to be subject to. That is why the state regularly puts in place things which merely facilitate your vision of the good life. That is why Benji had no response to my question about why the state enforces contracts. Benji said, well, the contract is state approved. The state should like enforce it. The state doesn't approve contracts, by the way. You don't have, there's no like state approval contract body. People sign contracts because they think they're good for themselves and their lives. And the state thinks it's good for them to pursue their vision of the good life. And if you say, oh, but contracts involve multiple people. All right, what about education? We educate people because we think that's fundamental to letting them discover and live out their vision of the good life. So the first reason, because this is fundamental to people's sense of self-worth and their dignity. But the second reason why it's also good for courts to exist is that they bring A, a level of certainty, and B, uh, a level of transparency and procedural fairness which people value, right? Religious texts are often difficult to interpret. People want some kind of guidance. They might get that from their pastor or their imam or their religious leader. That is great. But a court brings in so much more to that process of helping you live out your vision of the good life. Because it involves an open and fair process where two sides get to argue about what's actually happening, where reasoning needs to be given to you. Whereas if you ask your pastor what's right and wrong, your pastor just tells you this is right or wrong, and you have to take that as divine fear. So that's why the court process is hugely important to people, and they have a right to do this. Responding to the opening opposition stuff about how, oh, but they already have, like, religions already have moral authority. How can they have, like, 
of legal authority as well. This is no different from what the state does ordinarily. The state also claims moral authority, but the state also sets up criminal courts where it prosecutes and civil courts, which can simultaneously, pro simultaneously prosecute you for the same action, right? Look at what's happening to Donald Trump. He has one criminal case going through in the courts and another civil case going through in the courts. States regularly do this all the time. It's quite normal to have overlapping cases. It's not double jeopardy. Um, and if, I suppose, the concern of the opening up is that, what about cases of mass rape, right, of children in these conservative religious communities? Firstly, having these courts might give us some information about what's actually going on. If these cases come before the religious courts, which are more likely to have access to the information in these conservative religious communities, state oversight might increase. But also generally, I think this is a marginal issue, right? Either it's the case that your state, you know, has no enforcement power in these communities, or your state needs to, like, go in, which means it needs information, which it doesn't get if, as is usually the case in these scenarios, state power over these particular communities is weak to begin with. So we don't think you're opening up stuff particularly well. So let's talk about why this protects vulnerable minorities, um, especially in countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, which are democracies on a you know, broad level, but have lots of institutional weakness at the lower levels. Uh, we think it's very important. Why is that the case? Because we think in these communities, it's very, very normal if you're a gay person or of a different caste, to be subject to heinous communal punishment from the people around you. Sometimes this could be something like stoning. Sometimes this could be something like wholesale expulsion. The benefit of creating this system is that it allows minorities in particular to protect themselves from the excesses of that kind of communal justice. Now, the opening up says, but surely a conservative community would never accept your nice religious courts to begin with. That's a crude stereotype of religious communities. Sure, they might have extreme beliefs, but an appeal to religious texts and doctrine and practice and history, which these courts can do, is far more persuasive than the otherwise very alienating judicial or, uh, mechanisms of the secular state. Why is it therefore better for these cases to be processed in this way? Say, for instance, if I'm a gay person and I tell someone, look, I've already signed myself up for this, basically this contract right, with this court that it will have jurisdiction over me. Why is that useful protection for that person? The biggest protection is this, that the religious codes, even of conservative religion, offer way more protection to these vulnerable minorities than we typically expect. Let me give you a couple of examples from Sharia law, since that's just one I have to know fairly well, right? If you look at the punishments for um, fornication and like, you know, uh, forbidden forms of sex uh, under the Sharia code, under the code of punishments, the evidential requirements are so strict as to be almost impossible to fulfill. You need four eyewitness events for the actual penetration itself. Not even camera footage, actual eyewitnesses, right? So unless you did this in public, then it's impossible to prosecute. And those four individuals need to be what are called adil, right? Like morally upright individuals who do their five prayers, who have never been convicted of anything else, have never committed perjury. And also for things like theft or murder, you can you know, give compensation uh, as opposed to get punishment. So in many ways, it's actually a fairly liberal regime, right? At least at a procedural level. Diverting cases of minorities to these courts affords them that kind of protection. That's critical because these are communities who live in almost eternal fear of being discovered and being summarily put to death by the community in which they're embedded. Now at least they have a defense that an authority which you respect or respect more than a secular state has said, I should not be punished, that's protection. But it also means that these communities are now introduced to concepts which are often within these religious codes. Concepts like evidential burdens, like innocent beyond, uh, you know, proving your innocence beyond all reasonable doubt. These are concepts of the state with weak judicial institutions. The secular state might not be able to persuasively teach people, but the religious authority might be able to do so a lot more. So in the long run, we don't just protect them immediately, but we introduce them to concepts that are helpful for the community and helpful in allowing them to ensure that the most vulnerable among them receive the basic minimum of procedural justice they deserve as human beings. Uh, propose. All right, um, thank you for the speech. Uh, inviting the next, uh, the first speaker of closing opposition. Can people hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. Starting in three, two, one. What everyone misses in this debate is that as a religious person, you are inherently coerced to go to a religious court at the point where it is your own choice by the very fact that you are religious. 
because the imams and the rabbis that provide guidance to your community are those who are ordained to give the holy word. Which means that if it is your own choice not to go to a religious court, even if you are aware that there might be a material benefit for you, even if you have a different interpretation of religion, is simultaneously the direct committal of a sin of refusing guidance from those ordained to provide that guidance. Which means that you are forced into a position where you either have to give up potential benefits for yourself in this world or in the other world through damning yourself to eternal punishment, which you believe in. We think Ayat's proposition of people considering religious courts when choosing religions is absurd. First of all, we don't think people choose religions in most cases. First of all, you're very often born into it. You are taught by your parents to have a veneer of objectivity towards you. When you're like three years old, you have no idea what religion is, but you're taught stories about God. Even later, if you start to doubt it, you can face social disapprobation. You can be a person who has abandoned the religion. Your family made it so, and you know that in most Abrahamic religions, apostasy is a greater sin than not being a believer in the first place, because an apostate is someone who has given enlightenment and then refused enlightenment. So even, so even if you want to abandon the religion, there are huge barriers to that. And also we do not think that people go into a rational cost-benefit calculus, oh look, I am Muslim. I have always thought to be Muslim. Like there are too many religious courts here. I'm just gonna sign the opt-out slip and move out of it. That's not how it works, open government. But even if you do not believe all of, all, all of these premises, know that social disapprobation you face at the point where you refuse to opt into that court by your own will is horrible because you have literally put shame on your community, have put shame on your family by refusing the guidance that was given to you and offered to you and was ordained by God, which means your life is likely to be bullshit. You're likely to face discrimination, things like employment. You're likely to face things like family abuse or even disownment, losing of inheritance and things like that. We said, therefore, what this policy gives you an our set of acts is that the state absolves you of the responsibility to make that decision because it is no longer your own choice. Therefore, you not the agency that you can be held accountable for in the court of God, but also in the court and the eyes of your own community. Which means it is a precondition for your ability to even choose even choose a state court in the first place. Obviously, for this analysis to make sense, I would have to prove that religious courts are problematic, which is rebuttable, which engages with both open government and closing government. We note that in a large amount of these cases, which would usually be civil law cases in state courts, there are very clearly defined, predefined rules that cannot be reinterpreted. How inheritance is supposed to be redistributed between man and woman is very clearly in the Quran. How you are supposed to dress in order to be good before God and to be modest before God is very clearly defined in the Quran and in the Bible. The idea of how you're supposed to care for your children and what gender roles are supposed to be is also very clearly stated in Holy Scripture. This means that inherently a lot of those rules cannot be reinterpreted because they're stated as explicit rules which were given by God to Moses, like the, like the, the law of Leviticus, and so on and so forth. This means to respond to Ashish, there is no plurality of conceptions of the good because the conception of the good is a priori given, which means if you want to make a case for yourself, to make a reinterpretation, or to run your material, to run like a material benefit for something that you want to do for yourself, which I think is completely legitimate and adheres to Ashish's conception of the plurality of the conceptions of the good, you are unable to do that because there's an a priori law given from a divine authority, therefore unquestionable and uninterpretable, which means that if you are on the wrong side of that, you are automatically losing your case. But secondly, and even, and even worse, your own counsel is biased against you because opening government says we'll have religious officials being your defendants. But religious officials very often will not be able to defend you if defending you goes against their own religious beliefs or the beliefs of the church they belong to and they want to progress in because they either have spiritual or material reasons. Similar things happen in Thailand, right? The reason why people very often lose a Les Majesty cases is because Thai translators, in order to translate in a Les Majesty case, have to translate insults to the king, which they spiritually cannot bring themselves to do. This is the analogy that's probably going to happen here. But lastly, even if you get a positive precedent, this precedent is not likely to be followed in the future because it's going to be seen as an outlier. We see this in Christianity right now, like literally Pope Francis, who is the fucking Pope, so there's no bigger authority, is denounced by local bishops, like in places like Croatia, like, uh, like Croatia, like I don't know, uh, uh, Hungary and places like that, as a person who is too liberal, who has strayed away from the true path of the religion. Now, if this is not someone like the Pope, it's very easy to ignore a positive precedent. This means that the consequence of the case of the side government is that you only have one interpretation of religion, and that is the majority interpretation in that particular mosque or in that particular synagogue, instead of a plurality of conceptions of the good. So, to respond to closing government as well, in order to ensure that people have access to different unmeasurable conceptions of the good, be they 
different interpretations of one religion or opting out of the religion whatsoever, they need to have equitable access to a court of justice. At the point where they do not, and they are likely to lose a case and be stigmatized as sinners, this means that a priori we have decided that one cons unmeasurable conception of the good is going to win over others. The reason why this works differently in democracies is because in democracies we have a clear mechanism of transfer of powers to the state. Unless closing government can show how we directly transfer our right of consent to religion, we say this analogy cannot stand. Before I re proceed to respond even more to governments, uh, open government very quickly. Um, yeah, exactly Seo's analysis of why people are so influenced by religion explains why under status quo, these people are coerced into mob justice and kangaroo courts. This is much more important than the harm to, right, your, harm to your rights than the abstract ability to fulfill your personal morality. First of all, even if this court didn't happen underground, this means at least we can prosecute them. If we get a fucking tip off that this is happening like in, I don't know, the basement of a mosque, we can go to people. And this because you go, you have witnesses, you have processes where people actually talk of the atrocities that were committed. And also this means that the punishments which are meted out by the court are also illegitimate, which means you can you actually have the right to appeal on our side of the house because the punishment in and it of itself is illegitimate. But secondly, if people want harsher punishments and like just leaving fines, which probably happens, that, that still happens anyway. But, but, but then OG says is, ah, but you need to have the right to like control religious community and shape the rules based on your conception of religion. And CG repeats that. First of all, you already do, because as an imam, you are a person who literally transmits the word of God. As a Catholic priest, you perform the holy sacraments, which are crucial to your salvation, which means that your guidance is what decides whether or not people go to heaven or to hell. So you have the power to shape the community to the extent which the community believes in these things. But secondly, in terms of the punishment, the final punishment is the punishment of God. You believe that God will punish if something has been done wrong, and you live in the belief that this punishment will be meted out upon others if they have done something wrong. So the final, final punishment exists because the final court of justice is the court of God, where the punishment happens regardless of our material interpretation. So we say that if you're a believer, you believe in this anyway. So for all of those reasons, we say closing opposition wins this debate. Uh, yep. Thank you for the speech, and I invite the second speaker of closing government. Hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. Hello. I just want to deal with one thing that is a bit extraneous that happened the last minute of the member of opposition speech before I go on to explain why their extension just doesn't deal with whatever Ashish has already said. And it's in fact, I think, even less comparative than what the opening opposition did. The last thing that the member of opposition says is that it doesn't matter and we don't require physical religious courts on earth because if you're a genuinely religious person, you would otherwise be able to get your punishment in heaven anyway. So this motion is moot. First of all, that just argues against the premise of why individuals would opt into these courts in the first place. So that doesn't make any sense. But secondly, religiously speaking, people tend to see their lives on earth as a test for them to be able to enter into heaven, which means that all of the harms of psychological torment at a point at which you believe that you're not getting just punishment for what you have done wrong in this physical space brings you to hell, continues to apply in either scenario. So I think arguing that these religious courts are bad because people will think they will get their punishment in either scenario anyway sort of undercuts the entire premise of the closing opposition case. Second thing to talk about, the, co the notion that religion is coercive and therefore people are not actually able to opt out, this is incredibly bad. Uh, I think it's something they share with the opening opposition as well. Now let's talk about this concept of apost apostasy. And I think here it's important for us to note that context matters significantly when we talk about the amount of coercion that there exists for you to remain in or outside of your religion. So you can't just presume that coercion is equal regardless of your religious beliefs. In situations in which your country is fairly liberal, then we think that you have a equal ability to both opt in and opt out of those religious courts. This is crucial because it makes our extension incredibly important. In that, in these scenarios, if you have opted in, this suggests that religious punishment is incredibly important to you as a religious individual and that the state needs to give the extension of that particular right for you to be able to actualize those religious beliefs that you have in either scenario because the state doesn't have the ability to tell you that only one form of court is correct and only one form of court is good. We suggest that given that we give you the right to act like already practice your religion in private, we also give you the right to be able to be punished for yourself in private. These are things that we should already allow for these communities to do anyway. 
But what about the second scenario? In situations where religion is overtly coercive in the way that closing opposition suggests it is, and that people have no ability to opt out whatsoever. In such a scenario, we suggest that under that characterization, that means that religious punishment in, your, in a communal sense is likely to be incredibly powerful, such that the pressure to punish individuals that are seen to step out of what's religiously good, to be seen to be tainting the community, will exist in, <clears throat> in either scenario. This therefore suggests that in such a scenario, especially in countries where such religious conservatism is rampant, like Pakistan, for example, or like Bangladesh, for instance, in those kinds of scenarios, it is far more difficult for the state to be able to clamp down on bad religious interpretations. And here's where the analysis becomes very important. Because when you feel like you're a cornered religious minority or you're a cornered religious community, that's not able to actualize that kind of religious punishment in real life because the state is not allowing you to do so, this is when you're simultaneously more likely to also take matters into your own hands. The problem is because of the lack of actual state sanctioned courts or actual procedural justice that can be there, also because there's no excuse in a desperation to ensure that their community continues to go to heaven. We therefore suggest that in these scenarios, it is always better for you to have a religious procedural justice in place in order to ensure that at least some measure of fairness along the standards of your religious beliefs is meted out to these individuals as opposed to not. So therefore, you can't just take this in a like vacuum with regards to no context. You need to, you need to explain why is it that when coercion is that bad, that your analysis of freedom of choice necessarily exists on either every portion of this debate access to fairer judgment from these people is a good that I think the outside also concerned but it's can't fight against state laws let's then look at the principle of whether or not these religious courts are the to have so the OO and the CO have like two like quibbles with this the first thing that they argue is that this is about this is now a scenario in which you are not able to reinterpret what the laws are and therefore you don't consent to these laws but you are forced under religious scripture to be put under punishment for these laws. First of all, this just presumes that you have a lot of power or equal power to the state when it comes to having laws that you have to live under in a, in a democracy anyway. The truth of the matter is that even if you theoretically have some ability to say fight constitutional protections, this is not an equal power that you have with lawmakers or individuals who are already privileged in those societies. So if your question is about inequality in terms of access to interpretation, I think that's similar on either side. Um, secondly, religious laws are actually like quite well done. And in fact, in our scenario, we already told you why in fact, putting these things into courts makes procedural justice significantly better because it establishes practices in which you are better able to have an equal say as opposed to like places like Pakistan, for example, where communal violence is the only and definitive answer to the kind of punishment that you ought to get. But thirdly, most religions already have multiple reinterpretations anyway. So I think it's just a lie to suggest that there's only one interpretation and you will always lose under those forms, uh, in, uh, in those interpretations as well. Before I move on, um, can we have... Oh, Sure. What both closing and opening miss is that we can have community courts on our side of the house with the ability to enforce through community needs. This solves all of the problems that they have about mob justice, but we giving you nuanced explanation how gradually you get more abuse under your side, where gradually you get more involvement, it's through non-controversial cases, with the state on our side. Please engage. No, but that makes no sense, right? Because the very premise of what we are arguing is that you need to feel like this is something that appeals to your religion sense of what religious justice is. Your weird community like court thing that says that we have certain ideas of what you might want to do doesn't meet the standard of what religious people believe to be what is required for them to undergo in order for their community and themselves to be protected from the eternal fires of hell. So the point here to note is this, that the religious framework in which people use to decide what is a justifiable punishment is significantly different from the way that secular individuals view religious punishments. We might think they are barbaric, we might think that they are unfair, but they are ultimately what these people believe is necessary for them. And to say otherwise often visits this psychological torment upon these individuals. We also don't think it becomes worse because, again, you have to deal with the counterfactual where the state doesn't have the resources to be able to push these things for these people. Then the last thing to note then is this, that to the extent to which they want to argue about how um, you are not able to fight against your imam and etc., for instance, and how you're never going to be able to win about these interpretations. Like, if you truly believe in these religious strictures, it's uncertain why the state has the ability to tell you that these strictures and ways of valuing, like, 
things are wrong. But also secondly, I think there's more ability for you to be able to negotiate in our world as opposed to theirs. We're happy to propose. Thank you for your speech. Uh, to end the debate, I invite the second speaker of closing opposition right here. Um, uh, do you guys hear that echo? Um, hey, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah. Uh, this should work as well. Cool. Oh, just give me a few seconds. All right, I'll start in three, two, one. Look, so far this has been a mess. This is going to be very simple. We're firstly going to deal with codes and government and then weigh in on the opening half clash and basically explain what is the crucial comparative in this debate that TIN brings to you. The first thing I want to engage with coming from member of government, which I think is actually quite a cool principle, but I think it's self-defeating. Look at what Shish necessarily tells you here. When he says the reason why this should be allowed is for us to like maximize the people's ability, you know, to uh, act for religion or whatever, sort of standing on opening government here is to say, this is there is no metric of right or wrong. Or not have the epistemic access to it government should allow you to have your own way to so you should be allowed to fulfill your own conception of what is right or wrong and why because this is something that is unmeasurable right you don't have an access to it look this analysis might be true for an individual perceiving their own actions and how i'm going to feel after i do a certain action so this is like one-on-one -on -one, me with me but this cannot be a reasonable argument in the real material world where you actually engage with other actors right because this necessarily answers the question of how we measure morality because we often see something abstract but obviously for all of us to have a justice system we have to measure justice in a way it is always the some benefit or harm of your actions had on another actor right this means it doesn't matter if i think i was in the right if i made another person feel shit in the material that means it's exclusively tied to third party harm which means if religious logic is true, then this principle doesn't stand. If you don't have an access to other people's preferences of good and bad or what they want to do with their life because it's unmeasurable, you should always prioritize third party harm, which goes against his idea that we should always maximize just one's or individual's own conception of good. So in that stance, I don't think that is something that is relevant at, the, uh, at this point. Second thing, when they tell you, uh, but people want guidance and court breaks, okay, so literally this is analysis. People want guidance, and you know this is not a cooperative because people also have their priests, but courts bring something so much more tangible. I think this is the same piece of analysis that OG bases their case on, right? Which is to say that why this is very important for you to actualize your religion is because you need to have this idea of a court look. I honestly don't think this is the most important metric of you as a religious person, that you necessarily need this religious course to fulfill yourself as a person, right? And this is that OG in their own analysis concede. When Ayal talks to you, you need, you know, other people to communicate with you. You go to like religious sermons, etc. Exactly. You already have this status quo. You're relationship with God is the most like uh, like proximate one and most important one you will ever have. I'm not sure why it's necessarily tied to having a justice system court is specifically tied to you, but here's the thing. Punishment, in many cases, is not the part of your material experiences for you to be a believer, right? Because you are going to either get some sort of compensation in the in the afterlife or you're like the person that has harmed you is going to be punished in the afterlife, right? In most of the cases, when you commit a religious, let's say, sort of harm, very often, it's not automatically going to actualize itself in the material world it's something that's going to happen later it's something that you cannot even perceive at this point so if all of this is true i don't think that the metric of you need a religious court to be a self-actualized human like religious person stands i think there are many other things that you engage in as a religious person in every day level no matter if you're muslim christian or whatever that are much more important than you to be able to actually go to a court but also on the comparative that it brings the white box over which i'm going to get into a bit later but look and then what they say necessarily on the minorities are going to be more protected at the end of member of government. Look, I think there are two responses to this. The first thing, 
even if there's like a minority religion like Christianity or Islam or whatever, some people are still priorities over the other. There are minorities that are going to be fucked within the religious minority, right? You're going to prioritize a straight man over a gay man. And I'm sorry, but this is like, if you're talking about this example, right? So look, even if you go, best case for a closing government, even if the gay man goes to this religious court, it doesn't really matter if he wins, right? Because at the point where he engages with this court and he's literally trying to have evidence or he needs no matter, I don't know how many, you know, people to stand behind him, he is publicly coming out as a, as a person that is gay. So this isn't necessarily a problem. And I seem that as she should probably talking about the communities where this is not quite nice. This means he will probably be ostracized from the community. What does this mean? Risk of getting beaten up, completely abandoned by your family, etc. So even best case scenario, he somehow goes to religious court and wins. What does that actually even mean for this person if he's going to be completely ostracized? But last response here, religious courts in these types of states that CG wants to talk about, don't protect you from the state that is also oppressive probably and it also hates gays, right? So in Lebanon, it doesn't matter if you have a religious court or a state court, you're going to be fucked anyway, right? Because you're going to be jailed for literally wearing a pride flag. So I'm not sure how necessarily closing governments like cute religious courses actually have people that are fucked in these cases, right? And look, now to weigh in on what the actual comparative is in this debate, because I think with, with all of this, and what I'm going to do with now and weighing myself with OO, we're going to take out the rest of the debate, because this is what OO necessarily tells you here. What Sarah says, you need meaningful for consent, right? It's hard to imagine punishment, religious authority is not questionable, is punishment just, minorities, all of this stuff. I think we obviously agree, but there it lacks a significant compared to the status quo, because think all of these things are to an extent true for state courts, right? There's some sort of an authority or like uh, some authorities are questionable, etc. What Tim necessarily brings to you here is an argument which says that the state shouldn't put you between a rock and a hard place into making a decision that will necessarily delete your religious authority and your religious freedom. Before I go into it, I would take opening government. Yes. The only comparative oppositions give is that people listen to their imam and community courts exist. But these courts are, aren't able to levy fines, affect your hiring to a job within your community, or even force you to show up for the discussion. That's why yeah, they're cool. not able to solve conflicts within the community, which is their essential purpose. Okay, look, but this is not about like, so, so what the comparative is here, we would rather that people probably don't engage with any courts, or even if you're there cases that they don't go to state courts, or completely get fucked on your side and made to uh, put by the state to make a decision that's literally between a rock and a hard place, because it brings to, I think, four mechanisms as to why you can never actually opt into religion, right? I don't think I have to go and you have them in your notes, right? And also to an extent why, uh, extent why opting out doesn't happen. But what does this mean? This necessarily means that you're completely fucked on the comparative because I think uh, when you have religious courts, they're going to be A, biased against you, which also the team talks about, right? If you're divergent from the majority, you know, local imams and the priests are the ones that are actually, you know, uh, supposed to give you some sort of a, a punishment, they're going to appeal to the majority, right? Which is literally in your model, right? You have set interpretations that have been set here for decades, which means you're probably going to also be fucked, right? Uh, and also, I think at the point where also CG's case to stand, religious freedoms, you need multiple interpretations. This is very often not the case, but most important thing, if you lose the court, case you're a sinner but if you choose to opt out or think of opting out you're also a sinner because you rejected guidance that was offered to you but if the comparative is the state has a court that you have to go you don't have to go to this court it was never your fault to not into it because you didn't have to make this choice which is the most important thing in this debate for all these reasons please vote for the opposition uh thank you for the speech Is that the liberation room? 